Thank you very much. And uh, Ms. Channel, thank you for uh, being host this evening. And uh, thank you all for your uh, turnout. I'm, I'm very humbled by the, by the uh, numbers here and the turnout today. I, uh, I thought what I would do is, is basically two things. First, give a little bit of background to the report uh, for context. And then I will go into the report into some detail and essentially walk through in, in order, if you've read it, in, in the order that it appears. And this is the third report. And they seem to come, if you just looked at the years in sort of odd time frames, odd iterations, it's not once every three, four years, it's something that predictable or, or uh, uh, routine. This particular report was driven by a couple of, of things in terms of the timing. Number one, I think by our co-chairs, uh, Ambassador Armitage and Dr. Nye, there was a belief that uh, after the tragedy and, and the uh, horrific experiences people had here after 311, that op Operation Tomodachi, which followed, really was possibly the silver lining in that tragedy and gave us an opportunity as alliance managers, as supporters of the relationship, to really leverage some of the, the good sentiment and feeling about the alliance, about our respective forces, leverage that uh, for an opportunity to, to even further strengthen the alliance and maybe do some things that in another environment might be difficult or politically risky. And I think the feeling was that uh, after 18 months, while the sentiments remained positive and the atmospherics remained good, that perhaps we hadn't fully harvested the opportunities that, that came from Operation Tomodachi and that there, were, there was an agenda that we could put forward that could perhaps help to do that. It's an attempt to try to contribute to the dialogue and, and give uh, perhaps a positive agenda for both governments and both publics to consider. So that, that's the first point about timing. Number two, of course, we have our own election coming up in the United States. And in 2000, at the time of the first Armitage Nye report, uh, the report was timed just before a U.S. election at, at that time. So people like Rich Armitage, Torkel Patterson, Jim Kelly, Mike Green, um, they participated in this report, they came up with the ideas, and after the election they were in a position to do something about it. We have ambitions and hopes that something similar may happen, whether it's a Romney administration first term or a second term Obama administration. Uh, a combination of our, our wise men and our senior leaders, Ambassador Armitage, Dr. Nye, a group of uh, perhaps next generation, and then some functional experts that we needed to produce this report. <laughs> I will, I will draw out some of the main themes we were hoping to convey in each section, but let me start off at the outset by saying if there is one thing to take away, only one message, uh, we want people to understand that this was written by people who are advocates for the alliance, who want a strong Japan, who want a strong U.S.-Japan alliance, and believe we're the better for it if we make these hard choices, make the investments, and, and invest in the alliance. Going more into the substance of the report, if you were to look at a side-by-side -side comparison of the, of the previous reports Eric mentioned in this report, one thing that I think would, would jump out is we started this report not talking about defense, not talking about security, traditional security at least. We started this report by talking about energy and by talking about economics and trade. Uh, we did that deliberately. We wanted to send the message that these are important alliance issues. They're not exclusively domestic issues under the purview of each respective government. They're alliance issues. We want the United States and Japan to be resource allies. We want to be energy allies. Uh, we want to find ways to complement one another and to leverage one another's strengths. Uh, and that has a number of implications. We do talk about the nuclear issue, uh, but frankly, uh, I don't think there's a person in our group who wouldn't immediately say up front, it's for Japan to, to decide. It's for Japan to decide the energy mix, how to approach the nuclear issue. But what we do want to say is 
Uh, if Japan is going to make decisions about the energy mix, we hope they're decisions that can fully unleash Japan's economic potential, their potential as a first-tier country, uh, not decisions that in any way inhibit that possible future. We talk a lot about uh, the emerging uh, potential for a relationship around shale gas and, and LNG. Um, we think this makes sense uh, for the United States as a potential large producer and exporter, and it makes sense for a Japan that's looking for alternatives to nuclear, looking for alternatives that are clean, safe, and are scalable to, to produce large amounts of electricity. Further, we want to say if there was any crisis or any, any uh, shock to the uh, energy system again, as was the case after 311, uh, that the United States wants to provide all assurances possible uh, that we will do our part to ensure that Japan has a steady, secure, and safe supply of energy. Could be LNG, could be other uh, resources. But again, the notion is we want to be resource and energy allies going forward. The energy issue also relates to the delivery of energy and the safe and secure um, uh, delivery of the energy that we all need. So we do talk about Japan and the United States as an alliance and, and what we need to do to protect the sea lanes of communication to ensure that there would be safe and secure flows of energy in all kinds of environments and in all kinds of contingencies. <laughs>
which has given China the luxury of focusing on internal development and economic development, uh, that we believe that will continue to be the case in the future. That some in China like to suggest the U.S.-Japan alliance is uh, an anachronism, is somehow not appropriate for, for the future regional security challenges, uh, and that it's somehow oriented against China. We believe China can actually still benefit from the U.S.-Japan alliance as long as we have the right mix of policies. And when I say right mix of policies, it's an acknowledgement that our policies have always been a mix of hedging, uh, hedging and engagement hedging and engagement. That'll continue to be the case, but we have to get that blend right, getting the right uh, uh, and, and appropriate amount of, of hedging aspects, as well as engagement. From the, from the U.S. perspective, um, uh, and in previous Armitage and I reports, we've been appropriately careful about talking about uh, Japan's constitutional constraints, the Article 9 issue, of course. Uh, we continue to firmly uh, stress it is a decision for Japan to make and Japan only. Um, but we would be less than honest if we also didn't acknowledge that it is an inhibitor, it is an obstacle to closer uh, military cooperation, defense cooperation, going forward. It will become more consequential going forward if it's not dealt with in some manner. Um, so we have high aspirations for the alliance and the defense relationship and simply note that this is something uh, that should, in our view, be uh, removed as an obstacle if Japan shares those ambitions and aspirations for a strong defense relationship. <laughs> We also talk about uh, defense industrial cooperation, and this very much gets at the heart of our need in an age of austerity and budget constraints uh, to leverage the, the skills and talents and capabilities of one another. Uh, we very much, as a, as a study group, uh, applaud and endorse Japan's decision to change policy on the export principles. Uh, but since making that decision, we haven't seen the follow-through agenda associated with that. We've seen interest but not uh, uh, really any um, specific pursuit of, of joint development of platforms and how we can uh, take advantage of this new policy. We think that's something that should be done in a proactive way and, and have some ideas in the report about how to do that. We wanted a report on the table ready for consideration and discussion uh, that gives a blueprint and a roadmap for how to strengthen this alliance because we believe we're the better for a strong alliance. Um, so the spirit of this report, this study group, is uh, we speak candidly, maybe even bluntly. Uh, some of our recommendations uh, may at this time appear to be politically difficult or even uh, infeasible. Uh, that's okay. We want to talk about the long-term importance of the alliance one possible agenda, uh, but we welcome the debate that this may spur and, and may open. So thank you very much for your attendance, and thank you very much for your interest in this report, and I look forward to your questions and discussion. Thank you. Stay. Stay. On energy cooperation, I think, um, I would sort of dispute the notion that if we're selling uh, LNG to Japan, that it's only Japan that's benefiting. We're actually we're selling something. We're benefiting. We're we're uh, uh, having uh, industry supported, uh, particularly if, in order to get to the place where those exports are economically feasible, uh, that requires investment on the front end. There's a, there's a way we can benefit from cooperation with Japan in that regard, on the, on the front end of the investment um, uh, part of that uh, process. But there's another way, um, and, and I, I noted in my remarks that energy is not just the energy, it's delivery uh, and, and having confidence of safe and secure supplies. And I think Japan very much could have a role in maritime domain awareness, in protection of the sea lanes of communication, um, 
dealing with uh, possible local contingencies that, that could lead to disruption of energy flows. So I see a very direct way that the United States can benefit from Japan in, a, in an energy alliance in, in that regard.